You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. Today we are in Albero Bello. Cozze ci tene, cozze, cozze vicine. Non spicude ci cora, non spicude ci cora. Cozze ci tene, cozze, cozze vicine. Non spicude ci cora, se non mangiano le femmine. Well, that cork popping wasn't the sound of Caleb Ewan's bottle of victory, Asti Spumanti, popping on the podium. It was actually a rather nice bottle of Prosecco, Daniel, here at our wonderful recording location this evening. It's in the wrong part of Italy for Prosecco, but it doesn't matter, it's in Lionel. Well, I mean, they drink Prosecco in London. Do do you go around London saying you're in the wrong part of the world to drink Prosecco? You probably do, actually. We have have many policies. We've been very fastidious on this. Jira, we've got the mobile phone policy, and one of the policies, um, or at least one of the guidelines, is that we eat and drink locally. Um, alas, we've not managed it tonight, but we, we will try later, won't we? Oh, well, the, the, the owner of this very pleasant bed and breakfast where we're staying this evening has offered us, it would be remiss of us to decline a very kind offer on the basis that it's not local enough. And, and anyway... Staying. We're staying line in a masseria, which is, a, I, I gather, it's the sort of local word for a an old stable, old, um, what do you call it in English, where they where they milk the cows? Barn? Barn, kind of, yeah, kind of. And, then, and we're also staying, well, we're staying in another one tomorrow, but I think we're out of Puglia tomorrow night, and we're staying in Molise. Well, there's plenty of time for some Puglia with dinner later. Um, he's also brought us some snacks, some bruschetta, so chopped tomatoes and olive oil on on, uh, little rounds of bread. And the olive oil is made here, so you can't get any more local than that. So um, there we are. Um, Should we talk about the Giro d'Italia? Let's try and talk about it. It, It's not easy. It's not been easy this week, has it? Well, I don't know. I think we've done okay. Oh, good news. They've got they've got they've got a table at the restaurant. Oh, this is fantastic. Listeners, you'll be very glad to know. That uh, yeah, we we will eat this evening. That's good. That's Back to the good. cycling. Back to the cycling. Yeah. Well, shall I run through what happened, or rather, what didn't happen uh, in G- the Giro d'Italia today? Stage seven from Castro Villari to Alberto Bello, two hundred and twenty-four uh, kilometers. Quite a. It felt like a long day, didn't it, for them? We drove a fair bit of the course as well, didn't we, Daniel? It wasn't we did. terribly inspiring. An, an awful lot of main road, dual carriageway. I mean, I know they had to get here. They, you know, they're going very much. Round the arch of the foot of Italy. You're complaining that the Giro d'Italia is too long now? No, I'm not complaining it's too long. I'm just saying that, you know, it was a stage of necessity. They they wanted to finish in Albero Bello, and this was the only way to get there. I just hope that the foot of Italy isn't ticklish, because if it is, it might well have got, you know, a, a little frisson as the riders uh, pedalled their way across. Um, it wasn't a stage packed with action, let's be honest about it, but that doesn't mean nothing happened at all. Um, three riders got into the first break, and the only break, Simone Ponzi, um, doodle, who was the other one? Giuseppe Fonzi, and it was... Poggy Bonzi. <laughs> it was, it was uh, Kazonchuk of Gazprom. I felt sorry for Kazonchuk because quite a big guy. He didn't get an awful lot of shelter from uh, Fonzi. It, it was those two, Kazonchuk and Fonzi with an F, uh, rather than Ponzi with a P, who... Um, were away for most of the time because Ponzi punctured. It wasn't because there was some kind of Giro rule about riders with very similar surnames not being allowed in the same break. Ponzi in a break. Happy days, hey, I know. Happy days. <laughs> Indeed, it was happy days. Um, well, they stayed away. They, they had a lead and then they didn't have a lead. And then in the uh, finale, Christian Corran of Cannondale, he almost pulled it off. Well, he didn't really almost pull it off, but he had a go at trying to win on what we are now calling Davide Formolo Day, May the 12th, the two-year anniversary of Cannondale's last World Tour win. Fair dues to him, though, for having a go. Then came the sprint finish, and it was uh, the big four, wasn't it? It was uh, Andre Greipel in fourth, Sam Bennett in third, Fernando Gaviria in second, and Caleb Ewan in first. His first Giro stage win, his second Grand Tour stage win. No change overall. Bob Jung was in pink. Uh, Gaviria in Ciclamino, Polanch in blue as King of the Mountains. Jung also has a white jersey, which Adam Yates is wearing. But Daniel, two days on the Giro, five hours 35 in the saddle yesterday, sorry, today, and four hours 58 yesterday. 
um, that's an awful lot of cycling for not a great deal of return. <coughs> no, um, we'll just if we just concentrate first on the sprint finish. Um, I was in Abu Dhabi a few weeks ago when Caleb Ewan celebrated prematurely um, and lost the stage to Marcel Kittel, and it was notable today that he kept sprinting right until the finish line until he was over the finish line and um, that was well he owed his victory to that um, because it was very very close it was one of those finishing or one of those finales where the riders didn't really get a look at the line until about 150 meters to go there weren't dramatic bends in the last 600 meters but it kind of twisted and turned a little bit and um, consequently the rider who was at the front or best positioned with about 150 200 to go was always going to win and um, whether that was planning or just intuition and instinct from Caleb Ewan, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And there was a bit of beef in the finale between the Bora lead-out train and the Quickstep lead-out train. Um, Riquezi of Quickstep and Selig of Bora had a bit of a tangle. Um, from the overhead shots, it looked um, a bit like half a dozen of one, six of the other. Um, certainly... Riquezi was pretty aggrieved. Um, Sam Bennett, who is Bora Hansgrohe's sprinter, stood up for his lead out man at the finish line. Here's what he said. Um, Rudy did nothing wrong. He was just holding his position. And the other guys are the ones with the problem. Yeah, so there was Bennett saying that Selig had done nothing wrong. Riquezi didn't agree. He had a bit of a rant to Chiro, our friend Chiros Conyamidio. I know that I saw them deep in conversation um, shortly after the finish line. Um, it was a kind of typical racing incident. There were no repercussions. As far as we know, no one has been disqualified, no action taken. But, you know, it's already been a good a good Giro for Gaviria for quick step. And it, interesting, this battle of the two emerging sprinters. We've cops a bit of flack haven't we deservedly so it's always deserved when we cop any flack um on twitter about writing off gaviria and then and maybe bigging up ewan too much and then i um, not writing off ewan when we weren't bigging up gaviria um so what, what's the state now. what's the state of play now lionel well the state of play at the moment is uh, two for gaviria in this race one for ewan um and you, you do get the feeling ewan uh, well, he admitted it in the press conference. He said that the pressure had been building up. Uh, he won a stage of the Vuelta in 2015. And I think when we saw that and we've seen, um, you know, his speed, we, we thought that stages might come a little more readily for him. He was second at Bibioni to Greipel in last year's Giro. And I remember that being a very close finish and, and his sense of disappointment because it was his last opportunity to win a stage in the race. I think that came towards the end of the second week and then it was basically all mountains to the finish. And it was a sense of uh, missed opportunity. And then, of course, he wasn't in the Tour and I don't think he rode of well to last year either um, and so it's been a, a reasonable time coming this uh, second Grand Tour stage win for Ewan but what you said about the finish Daniel is ab- absolutely right because uh, they knew it had this little kink in the in the corner. They knew it was narrow. Andre Greipel has been on social media this evening saying that you know it wasn't a, a, an appropriate finish for a Grand Tour stage. But I think in the circumstances, they just about got away with it because really there's, what, half a dozen sort of first division sprinters here. Um, It wasn't like it was all absolutely all out spread across the road with, um, you know, 20 guys all trying to win. It worked out okay, And and, and really the finish line was on that corner, what, 150 metres to go. The first person into that. And, And Ewan did well to cut the corner the way he did without impeding riders behind him you know that was that was a good move very well timed and um he did say afterwards you know better to go early on that finish and get a good line because it was going to be very very difficult for well it was Gaviria the man trying to come up round the outside and and it's been a good day for them um I saw Matt White this morning he was looking very relaxed uh, sitting on a bench listening to commentary of a rugby league match from Australia I know nothing about Australian rugby league so forgive me if I get this wrong but I think he's a big Cronulla Sharks fan they're a, a team from Sydney and they were playing their local derby against the Dragons mate Look. and uh, and it was it was eighteen fourteen with a few minutes to go. He was listening to that, and I just said, "Well, maybe that's going to be a good omen. Perhaps today will be the day." And he said, "Sure, hope so, mate." And I was listening to him, mate, at the finish line. He was talking about Caleb Ewan and today's stage win really being a burden off Caleb Ewan's shoulders. Well, I think it's it's a relief because he's worked very hard to get here, uh, and yeah, the first couple of sprints were pretty frustrating. 
Um, and yeah, you'd be lying to say that it wasn't frustrating for him and, and the team. Uh, but yeah, his speed hasn't gone anywhere, and he just needed a clear run at the finish and, and a bit of luck, and uh, he got that today. And we always think of your team as a pretty boisterous, kind of happy-go-lucky bunch. Caleb always seems like a very calm, sort of tranquil kind of guy. Is that how he really is in and around the team? He is. He is. Uh, he's not a talker. Uh, he is a pretty, for, for his age, he's uh, quite a mature young fella and uh, he knows what he wants and uh, that's to be one of the world's best sprinters and he's uh, certainly on the way to achieving that. Yes, Lionel, we, we talked there about the finish and it being slightly, well, complicated and, and slightly sinuous there um, as the riders came into Alvaro Bello. But if ever there was a, well, justification for having a slightly fiddly finale it was today because I thought it looked fantastic on television we heard earlier in the Giro Mauro Vegni, the Giro director saying that he was really looking forward to the Alvaro Bello finish and um, I thought it did look great Manuel Quinciato was, a, was another rider I heard grousing at the finish as he came over the line he was uh, saying to another rider, rider that it was a criterium type finish and that was not a compliment um, but I again I think that there are times when finishes are dangerous and um, you can't really see why an organiser has has taken the route that way but today I think to finish in the middle of Alvaro Bella was absolutely worth it. Yeah it was it was stunning the little town there and these conical roofs made of the local stone um, very much a feature around here where we are we're perhaps uh, 12 kilometres away from Alvaro Bello but uh, it, it's still in evidence across the countryside here um, and I suppose though it's perhaps an unwelcome reminder to the riders that they are kind of the you know they are the circus coming into town and they're they're the performers aren't they they're the ones that have to get up on the on the the, the high wire and on the trapeze and and perform um, and it's up to the ringmaster to decide where they go and it's a tricky one that but I but think because of the way the race was. Like I say, if that had been a Tour de France finish, it would have been absolute chaos because the race is too big. There's too many riders all going for every place. Slightly different here at the Giro, and I think it was just about okay. And Lionel, this week, if ever there was a week um, that's been a reminder that 50% of the spectacle in cycling, and particularly Grand Grand, grand Tours, um, is the setting, the landscapes, the you know the places we've seen this week and we often forget it but um, again we heard from Veni earlier on in the race about the story that he wanted to tell with this Giro and the, the things that he wanted to show the world um, and the story he wanted to tell about Italy and um, yeah the riders sometimes they get the thin end of the wedge don't they? Well the problem is Daniel I mean this is the 100th Giro it's going to show off uh, the best of the country it's trying to visit as many of the regions as it possibly can the two islands of course at the beginning but um, you know if everyone's fallen asleep on the sofa and they miss the best of Italy on the TV, you know, it might end up being counterproductive. But shall we return to that well, the, Lionel, towards the end of the episode? Shall we? Shall we? Yeah, OK. OK, you've convinced me. Because I think it's time for a bit of a cultural interlude. Hi, I'm Sarah Clark, Chief Marketing Officer at Rapper. We have a, a very vibrant, young, energetic organisation. I think people look to us to keep pushing boundaries and to, to keep pushing the sport forward. And we try to do that in lots of different ways, obviously with the products that we create for people to wear, uh, the content that we create to really inspire people to get onto their bikes. Uh, and a lot of people know this already, but we're, we're very lucky. We give people until uh, lunchtime on Wednesdays to go and get a long ride in because you know that's very important for people to clear their minds and come back in with a really positive frame of mind but it also means that they can test our products because we're all ingrained cyclists at heart so it allows them to sort of keep living the sport and keep living our product in the best way possible. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Good morning, my name is Giacomo. Uh, I'm from uh, Civita. Uh, Civita is uh, Arbres Italian community. Allora, Arbres, praticamente Civita uh, è un insediamento albanese in quanto nel 1472, l'anno in cui fu fondata, Civita is an Albanian settlement and it was created in 1472 when refugees fled Albania, which was then under the control of the Turks, and made a new home here. The language we speak here is Arbres, which is basically 15th century Albanian. 
The Albanian influence is still really strong because Arbrecht is commonly spoken here even today. It also comes through what we call Valike, which are a festival of Albanian dances and songs that take place each Easter Sunday. These commemorate the liberation of Albania from Turkish rule. Daniel, I have to say, a week in, um, you've taken charge of all of the booking in a sort of uh, RCS style. You've decided exactly where we're staying. And I have to say, for consistently high standards, uh, you are in the pink jersey. Uh, last night in Civita, one beautiful town, we arrived at uh, in the dark, but I could even tell um, at night you know, how narrow the streets were, real sort of uh, medieval feel to it. And then this morning when I could see the views uh, and the rooftops, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, and again, another one of these strange, curious places that last year I remember the German, basically Germany in Italy, and last night was basically Albania in Italy. Very strange that right these down. places kind of survive and stay how they are. And we had a fantastic Albanian meal, didn't we? Albano Italian meal um, with some domsa, I think it's called, which is sort of pasta, sort of, uh, which looks more like a risotto. Well, and it, th- it had the texture of risotto as well. And and the the, uh, the man came out and showed us a little video on his iPad very much breaking the no screens at dinner time rule i did notice but didn't say anything um and he showed us a video of how this dish is made the uh the flour is dribbled with oregano water and then sieved and then the very fine flour is then stirred into tomato sauce and it kind of congeals into little sort of almost pearl barley ish rice ish blobs and i actually couldn't tell quite what it was i was eating because of the the texture was so similar to rice or pearl barley, but yeah, to find out it was pasta. Talking Very interesting. Of, I've got a great link here, Lionel. Talking of Albanians, Egut Zupa, uh-huh. um, who we spoke to last year on the podcast, was doing the Giro last year. He's riding for Villa Triestino, Villa Italia, and that team has um, well, it got a real rocket from its director sportive Luca Shinto got got the hairdryer treatment yesterday he's been ranting um a very voluble character Luca Shinto and he said to La Gazzetta yesterday that if it was up to him he'd send them all home because they hadn't been in any breaks or they'd been in very few breaks so kind of agreeing with you Lionel the smaller teams need to do more and that is why Fonzie I imagine was was out for hey. 200 kilometres today. <laughs> hey. Yes. Um, well, if you haven't seen Happy Days, um, a TV programme, I think made in the 70s but set in the 50s, um, that A that, hey, won't mean anything to you. Um, one just point of order on Villia Sele Italia, Willia Sele Italia. I've been calling them Willia. Um, I've heard you call them Willia as well, Daniel, in my defence here, but the pronunciation police have been on, and it, it, in Italian it would be Villia, wouldn't it? Um, Correct. We had a, a, a listener contact us on Twitter um, to clarify this. I noticed actually from, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I haven't got his name in front of me, but I did notice, I looked at his avatar, he rides a Villia bike, so presumably has an interest. Uh, and he in fact said that uh, some of his friends had been telling him he'd been um, pronouncing the name of his bike incorrectly by calling it Villia. And they cited me as uh, evidence for the uh, the prosecution. And uh, clearly I've got it wrong, so I'm ca- happy to correct that. Um just on the sort of the the type of racing we've had this week, Daniel, it's a it was a gamble, really, wasn't it? With the route, it's not like they haven't given opportunities. Um, Etna could have worked out differently if it hadn't been windy, but the race is it's it's in a it's in a bit of a slumber, isn't it? What's going to wake it up? When's it going to wake up? Will it be tomorrow, Saturday, stay to Peschici? Peschici? No, I think that Peschici. I think. Um we're going to see a similar stage to what we saw yesterday, tomorrow, to Peschici. I mean, the finishes we've had there in the past indicate that. Um, I think the GC riders will stick together until the final rise, which is quite a tough final climb. We'll talk about that later in the podcast. Um, we obviously expect the first big sort out to come at Blockhouse on Sunday, and I'm sure there will be some element of sifting out and sorting the wheat from the chaff. But I don't think it will be definitive by any means, and it wouldn't surprise me if we still had six, seven, eight guys um, separated by a few seconds on Sunday night because I think there are a lot of time trialists or, or GC riders who are good ch- time trialists in the race, like Garant Thomas, like Tom Dumoulin, who will be suspect in the third week. But at this point in the race, I think they'll 
they could well be able to live with the likes of Naira Quintana. Um, so I think we'll see more stalemate. And the Giro is really a victim of its own success this year in attracting so many big names because everyone is just scared to move a muscle. Yeah, I'd agree with that. There's so many riders all so close together. I said this a, a couple of days ago. It's a sort of reverse version of the stalemate you get in the final week of a, of a Grand Tour. But at least then, once the sort-outs happen, there are, there are reasons for people lower down the GC to attack. At the moment, everyone's just sitting tight. Yeah, this opening week, Daniel has been one for the purists but uh, a bit like a great test match you know it's not decided on the first day and the Giro isn't going to be decided in this in this week and we have to wait for it to come to life later on you are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you to Science in Sport for supporting the cycling podcast. If you would like to get your hands on their goodies, gels and energy bars and powders and that kind of thing to help you with your performance, you can get 20% off. Go to scienceinsport.com and enter the uh, code CPOD20. That's C-P-O-D-2-0. Uh, Daniel, what else have we got to talk about this evening before we go for our, our very fine dinner and a, perhaps a glass of Puglia? Well, I think we mentioned the um, conical houses in Alborobello, the Trulli. There is, or we, we've all also mentioned in the last few days, one famous Trullo, that's the singular of Trulli, in cycling, and that's the Trullo Volante, the flying Trullo. Um, and that was Leonardo Piepli, that was his nickname when he was a rider. Disgraced, of course, in 2008. Uh, really had a fantastic season, probably not surprisingly, as he was dope to the gills. Um, <laughs> and he won stages at the, I can't remember whether it was that year, he won stages at the Giro, but was very was riding very well at the Tour de France as well. Yeah, didn't he and Ricardo Rico do a 1 2 at Hotacam, perhaps it was in the Pyrenees? Yeah. Certainly, Pierre Pelli was going like a train, wasn't he? And um, yeah, and then he was already coming towards the end of his career, and he subsequently, sure enough, tested positive for. Chero, which was a second, which is kind of a second generation EPO. Not, we didn't hear much from him um, for a few years, and um, then he, he sort of resurfaced as a coach and um, yeah, called the Trullo Volante because he's from or he grew up in Alborobello. Bello. Um, I think he was born in Switzerland actually, but grew up there. And we wondered whether he might make an appearance today, and sure enough, there he was uh, mid afternoon in the press room. And um, a, a small crowd of journalists slowly formed around him. I didn't. I, I've spoken to him a couple of times over the last few years, and it's it's been fairly innocuous stuff. He's never really opened up. But today, um, he was really speaking. Seemed to be speaking without any filter, and it was it was quite. It was very candid, um, quite revealing. And um, well, here's a bit of what he said. Nunago, solo quel lato lì. The no needle policy coming in changed everything, I think. Just that measure immediately made it clear to everyone that everything in a needle was to be considered doping. Seems like such a trivial little thing, that rule, but psychologically it changes a lot. If you think about it, it's a nonsense. It wasn't exactly an act of genius. But psychologically, it changes everything. When I was a kid or a young rider, needles were just, well, part of your routine. It wasn't doping, it was recovery, or so they told you. But banning needles put a kind of mental break on you immediately. Suddenly then, even a little pill could scare you, whereas once it seemed like a joke, because you knew that you recovered with a needle. So now young riders are growing up with a different mentality. In Armstrong's days, in my days, there were kids who were already in this system at 14 or 15 years old, and who didn't even get to ask themselves these questions about needles and medicine. Also now, the teams operate a kind of anti-doping terrorism, and rightly so. A doping case is the only thing they absolutely can't justify. They can justify a bad season, but well, I'm quite friendly with Eusebio Unzue, the Movistar manager, and he's been telling me this for years now. A positive dope test is the one thing they can't justify to a sponsor. One bad season, two, even three, you can still say a star rider got sick, they raced badly, you recruited the wrong guys with some credibility vis-a-vis -vis the sponsor. But nothing explains away a doping case. Well, 
Well, that was interesting from Pierre Pelli. Obviously didn't have much to say about today's flat stage and, and sprint finish. Um, but what's he up to these days? Is he, is, is he, I heard he's he is, coaching something. Well, he is doing some coaching. He's coaching um, Filippo Posato. Um, or he, 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 Wouldn't he says too that much he, about he mainly that. goes out to eat with <laughs> Filippo Posato. He doesn't really coach him. Um, he coaches Angel Vicioso of Catuja, Losada from Catuja, um, Andre Amador. It wasn't coaching him last year, but he's coaching him this year. And the one that really surprised me that I didn't know was Davide Formolo from Cannondale. Um, but he was he was quite self-critical and quite open and um, certainly spoke a lot about how he'd had to take responsibility and was even sort of decrying the, the culture in Italian cycling, um, the sort of tolerance of dopers, in fact. I mean, he, he gave the example of where well, he's, he's currently attending a, a course, I think, for director sportifs at the Italian Cycling Federation. And he said that he went to one particular seminar and on the wall in the Italian Cycling Federation, wherever, whichever sort of regional department or office this was, there's a poster of him and Riccardo Rico celebrating a win and holding hands as they cross the finish line. I think it will, might have been the, the one in the Dolomites, the Trecima di Lavaredo, and he said this is uh, utterly ridiculous. He um, <laughs> could not quite believe um, what he was seeing, but the poster was was there to show the value of great teamwork. and um, It's a bit like the Argentinian Football Federation having a picture of Maradona punching the ball into the net against England in their foyer, isn't it? But there, there we are. It is, it is. And he talked a lot about how um, he thinks people can change, but you know, as we heard in the first clip, how the culture in cycling has changed. He talks about Movistar, the Movistar manager, Eusebio Unzue, um, Piopoli Road for Unzue um, during his career. And, and I asked him, for example... If he blamed people like Unzue for not having protected him more in his career, and especially when he was a young rider, and protected him from some of the vices that were rampant in cycling at that time, and here's what he said to that. No, anzi, for me, it has protected me too much. But, comunque, adesso, io dico una cosa. Io ho fatto quello che ho fatto. No, I think Unzue maybe even protected me too much. Let me say one thing. I did what I did. Circumstances, situations, influences, whatever the reason. I can't sit here and expect people to come over and pat me on the back. If I've suffered a bit as a result of my actions, that's how it should be. If someone jumps a red light and kills a pedestrian, it's no justification if, say, he's had a fight with his wife that morning, so has that on his mind. So no, if you come here asking me questions about doping, I can't let that offend me. It's not like I'm not guilty of anything. It's maybe not very nice or pleasant if someone's done nothing and then they get questions about doping. If you go asking Formolo about doping, it's perhaps not fair. What does he know about it? But I don't have a leg to stand on. Well, interesting stuff there from Pierre Pelli. Um Before we go, Daniel, let's look ahead to tomorrow's stage. And um, Orica Scott have had a good day with Caleb Ewan winning the stage. And they'll be right on it tomorrow, won't they, with Adam Yates currently in third place overall. Um, and it's a day maybe when he will try and do something. Well, Lionel, Matt White, the director sportive, was already looking forward to the Peskici stage this evening. I asked him what we should look forward to. As far as we're concerned, tomorrow we're just we're looking after uh, looking after GC, okay. so we won't be taking any responsibility tomorrow to, to bring it back for a sprint. It's an interesting one because Gaviria is in super shape and he does climb better than most sprinters. Could be a good stage for him, uh, but as someone punches, the problem is there's not there's not a Gilbert that sort of type of rider here. There's some you know, there's some good guys here, but uh, I think it's pretty open for tomorrow's stage. With the the gradient on the finish line, the GC guys will have to be in the mix anyway. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you'd be looking more for the punchy edge sort of GC guys. Um, but the GC guys will have to be there because there potentially could be splits. Terrific day for Matt White. There is his rugby league team has won. Uh, and Caleb Ewan has won and the Giro really starts tomorrow for Adam Yates um, before we go I should just say tomorrow we will be announcing I mean there will just be a, a drum roll when we announce the winner of the inaugural Giro 100 Pedaleur de Charme um, the recipient of that honour which has been voted for 
as we speak, but the poll will have closed by the time you listen to this, uh, Lucas Perstelberger had a what looks like an unassailable lead, unless Luca Pibanik's family you know, vote, vote multiple well, times. I hope there's going to be no Russian interference. <laughs> <laughs> no, we trust the results. We will trust the results that they're honest and true. Um, so we will be presenting the T-shirt to the winner over the weekend. Um, should also just mention that Rafa, our sponsors, they're showing the Giro every day in their clubhouses, which are dotted all over the globe. Um, and that more or less is it, it for is tonight. Final, except, except we're in the backyard of some good friends of ours, the the band Amaratera, who we've mentioned we mentioned various times already in the Giro, but they supply the music for our episodes in the Giro. Fantastic, evocative, Puglian uh, music, um, pizzica music. A lot of it's pizzica music. Pizzica is a traditional style of music uh, that was created in this region of Italy. Um, supposedly as a way of sort of um, as an antidote to spider venom um the legend has it that pizzica uh, it's a kind of it's a kind of vigorous shaking and wow. the vigorous shaking supposedly kind of dissipated dissolved the the toxins of a, of a spider's bite goodness me i mean i've survived the sharks i've survived the mafia I survived a near explosion at a petrol station today when, uh, to my astonishment, as we were filling up the car, the petrol station attendant was smoking on the forecourt and she didn't seem to be bothered one bit that that petrol and naked flames don't go terribly well together. Now you're telling me I've got to watch out for spiders. Well, let's play out with Amaratera and Daniel. I'll see you tomorrow. See you later. A reminder that you can watch the Giro d'Italia live and exclusive on Eurosport and Eurosport Player. UK viewers can also watch highlights of each stage at 10pm on free-to-air channel Quest. There's a special offer for the Eurosport Player, £29.99 for an all-access pass for the rest of 2017. Details of availability, compatible devices and full terms and conditions can be found on the Eurosport Player website, uk.eurosportplayer.com. You've been listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Thanks to them and thanks to our other sponsors, Science and Sport and Maserati, and to All Press Espresso for supporting our morning show, Kilometer Zero. The music in this episode is by Amara Terra. Thanks to them. Thanks to those who help keep us on the road, in particular David Luxon, Jonathan Rowe, Nick Christian and Simon Gill. And thanks to Adam Bowie, who produced this episode. Basta che non ti sciuto, basta che non